Hey guys, welcome. Today, we've got a genuinely inspiring guest. Not only has he been a trailblazer on the Dubai real estate market scene, but he was also the founder of the region's first regulated property crowdfunding platform, Smart Crowd. It's our honor to have him here because not only did he found Smart Crowd, but he's gone on to now mentoring young startup uh, startups and their founders, right? I want to learn from his market insight, his experience, maybe a few jokes that he might be able to bring along. Let's welcome Sadiq Farid. Welcome, brother. Assalamualaikum. Thanks for having me here, Fahad. Wa alaikum assalam. I want to jump straight into it, okay? Look, you've been involved in the market for a while now, and the market, we can say, has gone through considerable transformations over the last two decades, the first decade and the second decade. And we're now in like the middle of the third decade. What do you feel is the current state of the market? Because a lot of people ask, where is the market going? What do you think are the drivers of growth? What do you think and see the next two, three, four, five years happening in the UAE market? Yeah, so you know, I've been in Dubai for the last 10 years. Okay. Uh, you've been here much longer, so you've seen uh, sort of more cycles than I have seen over here. But personally, uh, this is the most bullish I've been in, not just in real estate, but the region, the country and city uh, mm. in general, uh, beyond just the real estate element. And there's a lot of fundamental reasons for that. But from a real estate specifically, I think at the state that we are in, you know, we're making that transition from uh, sort of a volatile emerging market to a more mature, stable um, market. And you can see that when you look at the data, uh, the cycles are getting longer, um, more end users in the market, mortgage transactions are on the high, uh, uh, and that's all telltale signs of a maturing market, bringing more stability. There's no more hot money in and out of the market, so it's less volatile. You won't see massive shocks mm. uh, to the prices. There might be some softness, some slowdown, but that's healthy. Right? Nothing goes up in a straight line. Uh, so that's where I feel like where the, where the market is. Um, what's driving this is all the structural reforms that the leadership has taken over the last half a decade or so, where we're starting to see uh, uh, the benefits of that now. Mm. Um, and going forward, I think that the biggest story over here is the population growth. As long as you believe in that population growth story, I, don't, I, I, can't, I can't imagine a reason why not to be excited about the way real estate now in the midterm and particularly in the long term. That's a very interesting point that you raised about the market maturing and the cycles getting longer. Explain this for the regular Joe. <laughs> no, it's a good point it because is, yeah. a lot of people don't understand this. So if you look at it, right, so Dubai real estate, I would say is what, 20 years old? Yeah. Right, we started in 2000, 2003. So we effectively just- 22 into, years old. Just 22 two years old, right? So you look at the first cycle from 2002 to the financial crisis, right? Um, that we had that boom and then bust, mm. but that was global bust. Right. Then you had a sort of a speedy recovery and then you saw that 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 price appreciation up to 2014 when the expo was announced. And then from there we had a steady decline uh, that got accelerated pre-COVID, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I have some interesting tell telltales in terms of the predictions, et cetera, at that point in time, what the data was telling us at that particular time. And then shortly after COVID, things have picked up, but then we've seen this sort of, that 2014 to 2020, right. uh, bottoming about 2021, was a pretty lengthy process. And it mm -hmm. wasn't like a steep drop, it was a right. steady drop with some structural, cyclical challenges, I wouldn't say structural challenges. Um, and we can talk more about that. Um, and, and since then, you have seen a nice steady recovery uh, driven by fundamentals, not through speculations. And if you lo look forward, it's hard to predict sort of in the short term, but medium to long term, you know, I don't see that trend breaking down, mm -hmm. all right? Regardless of, uh, a lot of people say it raise concerns around the geopolitical situation in the region. Right. Um, I actually think that it, that is actually a positive for Dubai, not necessarily a negative, if you look back in history, um, because this place is considered a safe haven, uh, not only because of its stability and security and safety, but also its uh, 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 proximity to US dollar. It's effectively a US dollar economy. So mm -hmm. that also attracts a lot of capital, et cetera. And given the other sort of safe haven jurisdictions, 
the structural problems they're save, uh, facing, the tax consequences they're saving is making this place more attractive. So not only are you attracting uh, people, population growth, you're also attracting a lot of capital right. uh, to the city. And that is uh, obviously showing up in the demand, which is obviously having a positive uh, impact on the pricing. Um, and the institutional money hasn't even come yet. Mm. So do you think the institutional money is going to now start coming in as the market gets more transparent and the data is there available? 100%. Um, so it takes time, right? So the the data, the transparency, the land department has taken that initiative a few years ago, right? And, and you know, my real estate experience, I'm a numbers guy, right? So for mm -hmm. me, you know, without data, I wouldn't be able to do what I do, right? So I find it extremely valuable. And I'm a hard heart, you know, finance person and institutional investors are like that, right? They look at purely from a numbers perspective, fundamentals, et cetera, and they need transparency, they need data, they need rules and regulations, et cetera, which Dubai has done a phenomenal job over the last half a decade or so to, to bring that level of confidence. But you're also seeing, you know, a lot of structural reforms that have taken place that's driving uh, uh, companies to come set up over here, et cetera. So that's sort of the first layer, right? So if you look at the finance, financial industry, you, it, DIFC is booming because you're attracting a whole bunch of financial institutions over here, especially the asset management industry. Um, uh, I actually think this is becoming the next Hong Kong because mm -hmm. Hong Kong has gone through a whole bunch of challenges, political challenges, okay. et cetera, over the last few years. Um, so you've seen a lot of migration of those people, talent, companies transitioning over here, even from Singapore okay. over here. You're starting to see a lot of financial professionals from London come over here. Why that is important, one, obviously population, talent, et cetera, that's adding economic value. But then that's also bringing, you know, tier one, grade A commercial companies that need commercial grade A space. level space. Right. So you're going to start seeing more because there's a shortage of tier one, uh, A grade commercials. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to obviously create more uh, institutional grade level investment opportunities that will bring institutional capital. Because you have to think, institutional capital is not, you know, buying apartments, villas, three right. million. We're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that need to be deployed, and you need to have those kinds of assets. And historically, there hasn't been that many grade A assets for people to deploy. Correct. So we're going to start seeing more and more of that. So those kinds of elements are going to attract institutional money because you need mm. to finance those and so forth. And you have the companies that are going to be anchored tenants in those places and so forth. So yeah, I think it's a early early days for institutional capital. To I come. think I think that's a very good. I think that's good insight for a lot of people. Why? Because you bring insight not just from the real estate side, but also from the capital DIC, the startup environment. So let's let's go back to the days when you started um, uh, crowdfunding, uh, the first region's first crowdfunding platform for property, right? Smart Crowd. Tell us about the challenges you faced trying to bring that trying to bring that dream to reality in the Dubai market, and what did you hope to achieve with that? Yeah, so going back almost six six years, um, um, you know, the, we were very early. Uh, our timing wasn't perfect, mm -hmm. if I'm being very honest. Um, but you know, for, for me, it was very much sort of purpose uh, driven in terms of why I wanted to do what I'm doing was to to give people opportunity to access this asset class you know particularly in this part of the world a lot of people want to do so but are priced out okay um, you just can't afford it right so how, how does smart crowd do that let's say let's say for the uninitiated somebody who doesn't know what crowdfunding is and some, what smart crowd actually does so if you think about from a retail investor like an individual uh you know we, i find there's three key challenges that people face um, when they're looking to invest in real estate. One is accessibility, right? Real estate is a very chunky investment, meaning it's, you know, it requires a lot of capital up front. Um, so for, for many, it's either unachievable because they don't have that kind of capital or they require financing, um, or it's, it's a big concentration of their overall investment portfolio. Um, so that's one big challenge, accessibility. Second is their ability to source deals, right? People don't have time to go do the research, or talk the to brokers, et cetera. And third is the expertise. So they might have money. They might have the, all the time in the world to go and talk and et cetera, but they don't have the expertise to really evaluate, hey, is this a better opportunity than this one? What's my strategy to maximize the value? When should I sell, et cetera, and so forth. So what SmartCard does is solves all three problems in a very convenient digital 
uh, manner. One, by fractionalizing the asset class, you make it accessible. So in, in taking a million dirham property and breaking down into 100 dirham chunks, you mm -hmm. can buy as many 100 dirham chunks as you want, as you can afford, right? Within uh, sort of a, uh, a, a, your portfolio construct, that is you know, appropriate allocation to real estate, and within that you can diversify for right. et cetera. So that's one. Second, the platform gives you access to pre-vetted investment opportunities that have already been sourced, all that work has been done, et cetera. And third, we provide you with a lot of content and data that one would require to make an effective decision. A smart decision. A smart decision, hence the smart crowd, right? So it's not about just giving oh, people that's access. that's what you meant by smart crowd. Yeah, no, because I you don't. want everyone to be part of that smart community, oh. the smart investor community. Okay. So it's not about just giving people access, but it's also making people uh, educated, right? Because okay. financial literacy is very poor. Even right. among educated people, yeah. it's very poor. So what it does, it, it gives you that, that skill set, right? So you are more confident in your abilities. And what I believe in is if you make person more educated, they appreciate the product even more so. So mm. you become a more, um, you know, sort of, I would say, sticky customer, right? right? Um, so that's, that's what Smart Crowd does effectively, mm. right? And when we started, you know, the couple of things, we were way too early in this whole um, startup ecosystem, right? It wasn't... Uh, 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 a glamorized uh, space that it is now, right? At that point in time, we're talking about 2017, 2018, uh, real estate market was going through a very tough time. And the biggest challenges were there was no, forget the regulatory framework, there was no legal framework to make this happen either. Okay. So we took a leap of faith thinking, listen, what we are trying to do has a lot of socioeconomic benefits, right? It is a value added to the overall sector, to the economy. And as we can get into those details, I don't wanna bore people with the That's economics fine. class okay. over here. But so we took a look at people of faith that, hey, we will be able to demonstrate to the relevant stakeholders that, hey, we're bringing a lot of value to the table. So please support us. Um, it wasn't easy, but Alhamdulillah, I, you know, uh, my tenacity and not taking no for an answer or not going away uh, led to uh, wholesale changes. Mm. Uh, you know, we were able to develop a whole new legal framework within the DIFC to enable this, work with the regulators to set up a whole new regulatory regime to enable this business model. It took us two years to get a license. Right. It wasn't easy, but it paved the way, not only for us, but not only other such platforms to come, but all of all other fintech right. companies to come and leverage of some of the infrastructure that we built around the legal framework, around some of the banking challenges, around client money, et cetera, right. and so forth, right? So you guys it, were like the cowboys. We were, to and a certain the good, extent. The good yeah, cowboys. I remember, like, I'll give you an example, right? I'm sure. Paving the way. So, you know, one of the biggest challenges you talk to any startup founder over here, what's the biggest challenge? You know, one of the top three challenges will be opening up bank accounts, by mm. far, right? Not just startups, any company over here, right? Mm. Just in general, right? Mm. Just one of the hardest mm. things. And we not only had to open up a company account, we had to open client money account. Right. Right. That is where it's like escrow account. Think yeah, of an escrow account. Which is even more complicated. It's much more complicated. It's never been done before, right? And Shouldn't be complicated, but it is complicated. It's very complicated. And for a small startup that's dealing in real estate with retail clients to have client money for that, mm. no one had ever done that. So I remember writing a letter to one of the leading banks in, uh, in, the, in the city over here mm. to, their, to their committee saying, hey, why are we doing what we're doing and providing an undertaking that, hey, let us experiment with this. If there's any, if you find any challenges, issues, shut it down. But if you don't, please let us proceed with it, wow. right? And Alhamdulillah, we had, you know, I was very lucky. We had, you know, uh, very uh, uh, forward thinking relationship managers that we're dealing with and they understood the whole financial um, ecosystem, particularly at an institution level, regulated uh, ecosystem, et cetera. And, and they were very supportive. Good. Um, uh, so we were able to, you know, overcome and, a lot of the challenges. And achieve and start. And y you really paved the way for a lot of the other smart crowning platforms. I don't know how many there are now, but you kind of tend to see one coming up almost every six months you see, okay. So now, so initially there weren't many. Right. Uh, we were there for a while by ourselves. Then none of the platform came. And I think now in terms of, I think on the register regulated, I think there are about half a dozen. Six. Um, uh, uh, okay, yeah. I thought that was like yeah. four or five, but okay. Yeah, six. but you've seen a lot in the last couple of years uh, and a few more in the pipeline, et cetera. Obviously, the market is doing what it's doing. It's going right. to attract people. And, you know, that, and, and the market is big enough, right? Okay. Like you can have multiple smart crowds. In, 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 has, in, has there been like some amazing success stories? Like somebody who invested, 
you know, there's that story like uh, people invested with Warren Buffett like $25 and had they kept their money along <laughs> for about 25 years, it would have been $200 million. So has there been yeah, any there stories has, like of course somebody who invested four or five years ago and he just held on to it and then, or if he had, he or she had held on to it, th- that investment would be now worth two times or three times, yeah. even if it's small. Yeah, so no, there is, right? Because <clears throat> so, you know, a lot of people questioned us, like, what we're doing, right? This was 2018, market was, you know, struggling and will still continue to go down. But if you look at the data at that point in time, uh, I was very bullish, even in 2018, 2019. Mm. In fact, if you look at the data, the market started picking up in late 2019, early 20, and then COVID came, sort of that kind of paused it, took another dip, and then it came back really strong. Uh, and in 2018, 2019, uh, there's probably a YouTube video somewhere, I have to dig it out where I said 2023, 2024, the market is going to turn and it's going to go freaking gun blazing um, because the data uh, was uh, very evident. Because if you at that point in time, if you recall from 2014 to 2020, the whole down curve, all the headlines always read supply, demand, supply, demand, right. imbalances, right? Yeah. And I hate headline investing, right? Because mm. if you look at the data, supply peaked in 2017. Right. Since then, it's been coming down. Oh, right. right? In terms of launches, et cetera and so forth. And recently it's picked up again, right? But for fundamental reasons and so forth. So, and, and you know, and it, to put up a new building, new communities, it doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. Like demand can come overnight. Yeah. Right? So I said, hey, this, 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 this uh, supply demand balance is going to flip on the other side and it's going to put a lot of pressure on your pricing, on your That's rental and so forth. That's a good point. However, COVID accelerated that timeline because that brought influx of demand quicker than I had anticipated. As you said, demand can happen overnight. Correct. And that happened, right? And that was case proven. So I remember in 2019, 2020, we started in 2018, we became public just before COVID. Uh, so, you know, in, in maybe we got lucky from that perspective, from a timing perspective. Um, but at that point in time, there was a lot of skepticism as well, too. I remember not just on the platform, but with, even within my social network, et cetera, I used to tell people, and buy, buy here, buy there, great value and so forth. People are like, who's going to go live in the desert, et cetera, and right. so forth. So to, to answer your question, um, our, uh, our, our biggest uh, sort of uh, home runs has been this small little unknown community. Uh, and people are like, who's going to go live out there, et cetera. But now if you look, all the developments happening, on yeah. that's one. But why that made sense to me was for a couple of reasons. One, it's a very mature community. It's been there for a while. Yeah, it's right? been there for a while. So it's very mature, very green, so forth. But what's really interesting is they have a type of unit in there that only a handful of communities have that are freehold. So they have these, what I call um, uh, stacked townhomes. Yeah. The two bedrooms. You have two, two, two bedrooms right. on the ground floor and then two, two bedrooms. So for me, uh, that was a great starter home because right. it's about 1,400 square feet, two bedroom. The ground floor ones are beautiful because you get a backyard, et cetera, and so forth. Um, and even during, like even during the, you know, when the market was tough, et cetera, the prices there at that point, if I remember correctly, we, 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 we went and bought around 765. Right. And it, it was a portfolio of one of the institutions that was sitting a lot of, and they were, they were liquidating their, their portfolio at that time. And even in that time, they were renting around 60,000. Right. Right. And because there's, uh, townhomes, the service charges on those are next to nothing. Okay. Right. We're talking about three, four dirhams per square That's foot. Good. So it's about five, 6,000 dirhams. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, so as a percentage of a service charge to rent, which is one of the key ratios that we look at, was about 10% or less. So I'm like, that's freaking phenomenal because what that means is if the rents come down, et cetera, your service charges are not a big component, so your yield doesn't get hurt too much. Mm. So, and I told every, a lot of my f- social friends, like, hey, this institution, they have like 60 properties there, they're liquidating it. If you have any cash, mm. buy. It's the best value in Dubai. And people right. used to laugh, like, who's going to go live in there? It's right. a desert, a cockroach, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, yeah. right? Long story short, we exited that um, this earlier this year or late last year. I can't remember the exact date. Okay. 1.6. Mm, almost double. 765. Yeah. 1.6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it More was rented double. for 90,000 during the whole point. Oh, wow. Period, right? So investors who put money in there... Um, they walked away with a total ROI, net of fees, 110% return, roughly. That's not bad. Without right? doing a lot of work. Nothing. Because you guys do the, all the work, right? So 
the thing is, but the guy wants to get rich overnight, but, you know, he wants to control everything. And then, you know, but in your scenario, you guys do all the work you've identified. And pr probably because you've got your own investments in the market, you have your finger on the pulse of the market. So you can identify these. The regular Joe can't do this, right? He doesn't know, as you said, where Waha is. He doesn't even understand the value proposition. Okay, so let, that's but a great story. You know, past results are not indicative of future results. That's it's fine. a different market, et cetera. But you know, to your point, right? You know, smart crowd was driven out of a personal need. I wanted to invest in real estate, struggling to find stuff that I could afford without you know putting a lot of my capital into one asset or getting leverage, and I don't want to do that, right? And then I realized- And you didn't want to take it out of gold, so. <laughs> we'll get into that separate <laughs> later. But you know, I realized there's lots of other people in the similar boat. Right. Um, and you know, the, the, my whole purpose of finding this was about leveling the playing field, right? Mm. The rich are able to preserve their capital and grow their capital because they're able to invest in such type of assets that lowers their risk profile overall, right? Because the real estate, historical, uh, if you look at the empirical evidence, having real estate in one's portfolio improves your returns and lowers the risk because of real estate is not very volatile. It provides a steady flow of income into your portfolio that you can use to compound, et cetera. So wealthy people are able to park some of their money there that allows them to take risk, bigger bets yes. to get wealthy. Average person cannot do cannot that. do that. So the whole idea of doing this was, hey, give people, harder working people, ability to have opportunity to invest in a similar fashion as the wealthy can so we can level the playing field Makes it's not sense. about uh, uh it's about equitable uh, opportunities right and i wrote this piece when i first started smart crowd if you go to my linkedin today there's a piece called our purpose and i penned it like hey this is the reason mm. i'm doing this so it's clearly defined as to what is success to me Marshall. because success is not just about money mm. right and that that dna enlists with every single thing that smart crowd did it's like hey i'm treating other people's money as if it's my own money, right? Like where would I invest, right? So a lot of thought goes into figuring out where, how, uh, how meaning, what's the strategy? What's the rental strategy? We can talk about a lot of stuff that we did that again, data told us well before trends came in the market. Mm. Talk about holiday homes, talk about this rent now pay later, which is becoming a very, we were doing this in 2019, mm. right? But we're doing it from our own strategies. We weren't using other people's money to pay landlords and give flexibility, we just had a rental strategy that enabled that, that allowed us to you know, generate 20, 10 to 20% more yield than the market. That makes makes a lot of sense. Okay, so let's let's talk to the regular investor who's coming in right now as well. Like, you know, they feel there is a lot of opportunity. Where do you, in your expert view, think that, hey, look, this area or this asset or this property holds the most promise yeah. keeping in mind like some of these launch properties are getting sold in a day like you literally you, you've got to go in and fight uh it's like 2007 2006 you've got to fight with other people uh granted the 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 system's a little better to book a property now they can well launch properties are kind of like almost difficult to get it so, is so tell me in your opinion which properties assets have the most promise yeah, I don't like to make predictions. I'll be very honest, sure. and it's uh, it's very difficult to 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 predict because Dubai is very unique, in the sense that it it, it caters to different segments, mm -hmm. um, and and there's pockets of opportunities across the spectrum. So it all depends in terms of what's your time horizon. Okay, what are your goals? Uh, because there's, there's no one size fits all uh, mm -hmm. strategy, and I don't want to say something tomorrow. Someone goes and buys, and they're like, oh, it's five years later, Siddiqui told me to do it, and I haven't right, made money, yeah. right? So it, it all depends in terms of what what, are, what is your appetite? Hey, are you looking for income? Are you looking for pure appreciation? Are you looking for a balanced approach? But I'll break it down in terms of where I see opportunities, different kinds of opportunities to cater to different people. Um, you know, obviously you have, uh, you know, we talked about population growth that's driving a lot of the, the, the demand, right? That's also leading to a demographic shift in Dubai. So if you look at historically, you know, this city was being built. So a big pop, big part of the population was your blue collar labor, mm. right? And blue collar labor is not very additive to the uh, economic value because they don't have purchasing, purchasing power. Yeah. Um, and they wouldn't add a lot of value. A lot of their money would get remitted back to their home Correct. countries. Okay. Most of the time, But yeah. But the city is fairly developed now. There's mm. still construction going on, infrastructure, et cetera, but not at the scale or pace that was required 10, 15 years ago. But now that portion of the population has shrunk and you have got more white collar laborers, like skilled laborers, especially with the digital nomad, executive nomads, golden visa offering and so forth. So you have people that 
that need housing, that are adding, you know, malls, restaurants, roads, packed. Right, right? yeah, which, so, which we see now. We right see, now. right? It's growing pains, right? right? So, and these people are all adding value to it, right? But hey, you need to understand what is that population breakdown, where are people living, what kind of housing, et cetera, and so forth. So if you look at the data, the data will tell you a lot of things. And what's really amazing mm. uh, now with a lot of IPOs of government entities like Salik, like Diva, uh, uh, because they're public now, they have to disclose a lot of information. So what's really amazing is the proxy information that you can use. So now I can see, hey, what's the traffic on Salik? How many cars are going through the right. gates, et cetera? That gives you indication of, hey, what's the population level, et cetera, right? So you get these sort of indicators that oh, feed how into many real estate. driving. And you look that's at what the, the large funds are going to be using. Institutional level. So this is, that's, that's, that's the beautiful, beautiful thing about it. Diva information is great, right? Because you can see, hey, where are the connections? Where are the disconnection? That gives you an right. indication. Where's the migration within the city and so forth? So I'm giving you variables that you can use to predict which areas. You have the 2040 plan, urban plan, that the, uh, the government has uh, uh, publicly announced. You have the D33 economic plan. And look in those elements as to where are the key areas, right? So if you look at those areas uh, from, from memory, um, Expo is one. Mm. Dubai Silicon Oasis is one. Um, uh, and uh, downtown core, uh, Business Bay downtown is one. And... Um, uh, there's uh, two more things, the creek area, et cetera, I believe, is, or another one, right? So don't quote me on it. Obviously, right, you can, right, yeah, you can yeah, clearly yeah. see where my bias is by remembering the specific ones that I'm interested <laughs> in. But that gives you a lot of indication in terms of where the opportunities are. And then again, you want to where you want to be. You want to be on the premium side. You want to be on the affordable side. So it depends on if you have patient capital, be on the premium, right? right. But be suspectable because if you look at the historical trends, you know, Palm is usually the leading indicator. It does really well. The market is good. When the market is bad, it takes the biggest hit it as takes, well. Too. It takes a big hit as right? well. But yeah. that's historically because hot money will come in and hot money will go out, right? But that's not the case anymore. So it might not follow the same trend, right. but be wary of that. But that requires patient capital. You need to have holding power. Uh, in the you, Palm. In the, uh, any luxury. Or, or any, any other luxury, luxury right? premium community. Premium community. You need to have holding power. You need to have patience. And that's a pure capital appreciation story. Right. You're not going to generate cash yield on those opportunities. If you're looking for something liquid that is cash generating, will also give you capital appreciation. And when there's volume, look at affordable areas. Mm, right? The residential areas. The I residential call affordable areas. The JVC. Uh, so JVC is uh, another strategy. So okay. what I'm talking about is like DSO, IMPZ. Okay. International city to a certain extent, I'm not a big fan, right? Mm -hmm. And there's reasons for that. But DSO, uh, there's metro stations coming there in the future. And that kind of clientele likes metro station. IMPZ is another area that I like from an affordability perspective and so forth. Uh, they're, uh, one, they give you good cash yield. They're relatively liquid in the sense a lot of volume of yeah. transactions because the entry points are, so there's always investors. What did you mean about JVC? Different strategy for JVC? So JVC, what I would say is, I would say middle class, upper middle class, hmm. all right? Again, JVC is very interesting because even, even within JVC, you have different segments, uh, you have right? Like maybe like five segments. I would, yeah, so I, would, I, I categorize into three, tier one, tier two, three, three, right. right? So tier three would be your sort of affordable, similar to DSO, IMPZ, but if you're going to go into that area, why, why tackle that? If you're going to do that, do it in the areas that they are more, known for, right. instead of trying to go in and do something there, right? It could work. I can talk about some examples in Marina that we applied that strategy for affordable living in Marina from a holiday home perspective to provide affordable tools. Did it work very well? or Phenomenal from okay. a cash perspective. And then we exited some of these things at relatively right. okay. good value because we feel Marina has matured. Mm -hmm. with very little upside versus compared to downside. So we've transitioned that capital into other areas. But JVC, where I find is it's a lifestyle, right? Um, despite all the infrastructure challenges people love that area uh, if you look at the last five Is years it, most transacted why do you think they love the area so and the rental yields are high so which means that people like to live there so we started buying jvc in 2018 2019 people were like what the hell are you doing it's mm. like in the middle of nowhere but i was like look at the data man it's like mm. yeah you have a lot, of, a lot of supply coming but it was all getting absorbed if you last five years what are the most most uh, JVC right? JVC rental incomes very JVC, high. JVC most well. uh, most uh, developed properties, most handed over properties, most transacted properties, most rental transaction properties, all in JVC. Thirty thousand units delivered in the last five years or so, all observed. Another thirty thousand in the pipeline. Um, so, but 
I think the key, and this is again, right? People don't look at these things, right? So if you look at Google Trends, traffic, et cetera, you saw, you can see a lot of people living in that part of town. The Um Sakim has a corridor, all the amenities are there, hospitals, schools are in that corridor, right? Second, I think the fundamental driver for JVC are two assets in JVC, mm -hmm. the Five Hotel and the First Collective. Mm. That has changed the whole gentrification of that area. So initially, I thought JVC as a family oriented, and it is to a certain extent relatively family right. oriented, but because of the Five Hotel and the First Collective. First Collection or First Collective? First Collection, I think it okay. is. It has attracted a whole kind of younger crowd from marina living into JVC, into suburb living. Right. Right? So you see a lot of young professionals that like to socialize, et cetera. In fact, one of the most popular areas for short-term stays is JVC. For that reason, people right. go, they're coming to here, look for jobs, set up businesses. They tend to find temporary accommodation in JVC because they feel like they can network, they can connect with people and so forth. So that, and then you have to look at those kinds of assets, mm -hmm. tier one assets. For me, that is G plus eight maximum. Okay. Resort type living, beautiful amenities, pools, gym, Instagrammable, hmm. younger population. That's my target for JVC, right? That can afford a studio rent of 60, 70,000 dirhams. Right. You can buy those for six to 700,000, maybe more now. Yes. But that gives you a gross of nine to 10%. On a cash on cash basis, you can get gen generate Very six to 7%. Very interesting. Right? So that's, so I consider that a, a different sort of, a, I would say a more balanced. You get a nice cash yield, but you also get uh, get some capital appreciation. Gotcha. So, so it's different pockets of different things. So the other way to 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 uh, to identify opportunities is to look at what the leadership is doing, right? What is the leadership's uh, vision, okay. right? Because if you look at the last, you know, the history of Dubai, leadership has delivered. Every time right. people have questioned their ability to 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 deliver, they have they have far succeeded or right. uh, far exceeded people's expectations, right? Mm. So what are the plans for the leadership? What is the development, the urban plan, et cetera, the new airport coming, the, the recent announcement of uh, the new Expo City, right, et cetera. Yes. So that should give people telltale sign, you know, uh, Palm Jabal Ali, there's whole announcement of another six kilometer of beach on wow. the other side of Palm Jabal Ali. These are early mm. things, right? Do you have the patience to go in today and yeah. wait for the next 10 years to make money? Just like if you could have bought Springs in 2002, yeah. And you, you you know those prices. If you don't remember, like three bedrooms were like less than half a million there. Six hundred fifty thousand, six seventy five thousand. What were the prices yeah. for greens when they were yeah. launched? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So, but that's where it's right? like you have that kind of patient capital and long term vision mm. in Dubai, right? Yes, you'll go through some cycles. If you do, you'll do very well. You'll be phenomenal. If you had bought back then and sold, uh, or you know, like oh, sorry, one bedroom in Shoreline was six hundred twenty five. I don't remember. I think Springs were around the half a million mark. Yeah. The villas, uh, and you, you've I've done a case study on this six twenty five, and they're they're at three million today, plus the rent that you would have got one point six million since two thousand eight. And the other thing you have to also factor in from that perspective is the majority of the people that were buying at that time were foreign investors. Mm. What was the dollar then, and what is the dollar today? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, if yeah. you were an Indian investor or a Pakistani investor or even a British investor back when Shoreline, you would have done well. Uh, you right? you've done from, well. At least from you're a currency stable, perspective, right? stable currency. Just from a currency perspective, yeah, you yeah, would have yeah, made yeah. tons of money. But now you have also capital appreciation on that income. Makes sense, uh, right? Let's talk about your entrepreneurship journey further a little bit. Like you're now actually uh, an advisor to other startup companies that are coming up. Uh, tell us a little bit how you've transitioned from being a founder to a mentor. And what excites you about this phase? Honestly, uh, opportunity to give back, okay. right? Because listen, I was a first time entrepreneur, still am, right? Mm -hmm. uh, learn a lot, uh, both by doing stuff, but also from a lot of mistakes. Um, and by advising or mentoring others, uh, it gives me an opportunity to, to pass on that wisdom. So okay. to ensure people don't make the same mistakes. Um, give them a better advantage in terms What's of what's your I, biggest lessons oof, or biggest mistakes? There's, there's, there's lots maybe of lessons. Maybe the top one. There's lots of lessons, right? So uh, don't be too conservative, mm. is probably one. Uh, you know, that's just by training, okay. being a chartered accountant by background, okay. a CFA charter holder. 
um, you know, professionally trained as a very risk averse person. Right. That's a very, it's a big dilemma being an entrepreneur, which is traditionally a very risky right, uh, right, venture. Right. So finding that balance you can be quite th tricky. Have you overcome that? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Do you think you can? It's, it's challenging because you also have to understand it's one element of being entrepreneur and taking risk taking. Right. But you also understand the kind of business that I founded, it's people's money. Right. Right. You, you, you can be a cowboy uh -huh. in that situation, yeah, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, li I, I, I like my sleep. I like to sleep right. at night, yeah, right? Yeah, Comfortably, that's true. not uh, stressing about people. Trust me, in the early days, uh, I used to wake up with sweats because people were like investing their hard earned money, trusting me. And that's a big responsibility mm -hmm. that you don't take like, I don't, I didn't take lightly, right? Mm. Some people don't have a conscience and they will do it just to make money, et cetera, and, right. and, and make bets, et cetera. And there are people that do that, unfortunately. That's another reason I wanted to find Smart Card to give people uh, a fair opportunity to, uh, to, to earn, uh, earn a return. Because, you, you know, um, when I first started this around that time, uh, you know, people here in Dubai, alhamdulillah, generally do quite well. They have good disposable income. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Okay. Let's say you were, let's say now, given your uh, viewpoint of having experience, you were mentoring a young entrepreneur and you could see that he is scared or he's playing it too conservative, right? Because being entrepreneur, being entrepreneur, you've got to dream big. Yes, you've got to uh, put your chips in the right way. What would you counsel this person to say, look, break through the barrier of fear. Yeah. Take the risk that's calculated, of course. Correct. How would you tell him? Yeah, How so, would you train him? Yeah, so... Skydiving, <laughs> take him, throw him off the plane. Don't do things blindly, right? So consult. Okay. I have proper governance in place and, and, and document your process. And then go for it. And then go for it, right? As long as you've done and you've done your due diligence and you put a framework and you have a process, God forbid mm. something happens, you have a credible way. Hey, listen, this was a thought process. Right. Governance, check and balance in place. And we had to do it. You know, there's, there's, there's two elements that I think I have learned, right? Um, which I'm still dealing with or, or managing, right? Okay. So, you know, you very commonly you hear about fear of failure, mm -hmm. right? Which is very common. What people don't understand is, you know, there's one more thing that you have to overcome, which is fear of success, mm -hmm. right? Because when you're doing something new, et cetera, success can come quickly and it can overwhelm people, right? Uh, and people aren't be, trained for it. People aren't trained for it. And that could Fame, be quite scary. success. It could be very scary. So yeah. trying to do things, sometimes subconsciously, you don't want to be too aggressive, et cetera, because that might bring a lot of, you know, attention, et cetera, and so forth. And you might, like, maybe I'm not doing things right. Mm. Why am I getting this, et cetera? So managing that, right? So having uh, advisors, mentors that have been there, done through that, I didn't have that opportunity. You know, I, you know, for... Uh, for for whatever reason, you know, I thought, hey, I'm fairly well educated. I know the market relatively well. I, I believe in my capabilities. I, I don't need much advice. I can figure things out. And alhamdulillah, to a certain extent, a lot of things I did figure out, but there's a lot of things I did not, mm. right? That cost me. Um, but that's eco talking, right? Uh, regardless how smart you are, et cetera, it's always good to have advisors who've been there, done it, done it yeah. that can help you. And people that don't have a vested interest, so completely unbiased support. So, so I mean, like a free coach. Where do you get a free coach? Or <laughs> free, a free coach mentor? in the sense, like you know, you, you can have some level, but it's not like they have. Uh, there's no vested interest in the sense that you know they're not going to get hurt or benefit from your success or failure. They're not right? on your board. They're not on your board. They're not your investors, etc., and so forth, right? Because they're, I, I don't think that comes uh, uh, necessarily uh, completely, you know, sort of um, genuine support advice, et cetera, and so, so forth, because there's a bias. Uh, so so in there. You, you've hit on a very, very, very potent point, by the way. Yeah, just the FYI, because Tony Robbins talks about this, right? So I don't know if you know Tony's early success story. He, he found fame and money very early on in his life, like he was 18 or 20. Like he had so much money, he could take his friends on ski trips and tell them not to work and he'll pay for them. But what he found was they didn't really appreciate that because they're not at the same energy level. And then he started sabotaging his success. He wouldn't show up on meetings. He wouldn't work well. He, he put on weight. So you, you've mentioned this. Like, Do you think that you, you had that fear of success? Uh, I think that there's parts of it. Mm. I think I was... Um, uh, there was times, I think, it, it did crep, crep, 
keep it creeping. Uh, okay. Parts of it. Did you beat it back? Like, <laughs> go away. I need to see. Uh, it's a raw nerve, man. I can, te- I can tell I've touched something over there. No, it's, it's, it's still something that I am, you know, uh, uh, evaluating, reflecting upon, et cetera, and so forth. Inshallah. But, but, but this, is, this, is, you know, this is a journey, right? It's a journey. I, I'm not at my destination yet. That's, that's true. Like sometimes, you know, like, uh, there's like famous actors who've, who've wished for stardom and fame. And then all of a sudden they realize like fame brings with its responsibility where, you know, you can't sit in a restaurant and have a regular uh, coffee because you're going to get hounded, right? So you've got a very important point. I, I'm not that popular. Don't. That's <laughs> not what I'm worried I, I about. <laughs> be, inshallah khair. Okay, I want you. We're gonna wrap up this part, but I want you That's to give. That's never happened to me, by the way. Walking in some mall and someone stops me, like, "Oh, you're the founder." Are you the smart no. crowd guy? Because has, it, it, I made money from you. It, it has happened at obviously events like startup right. events, etc. Because there, people, it's a they, small community. They know about people, you people and all of that. But, yeah. but randomly. You know, sometimes you do, you're walking and people are staring at you. And you're wondering like, hey, uh, <laughs> is he trying to like put my face to some name that he's probably seen somewhere? Because I used to be quite active on social. I haven't right. been in the last two, three years because I've been very busy. Right. But initially when we first started in Smart Card and like from 2018 to 2021, 2022, I was you're very, very active, active. Okay. on nice social, on YouTube, nice. et cetera. And you can go and find stuff there from, from that time. But I haven't been in the last two, three years. Mm, okay. Parting words, parting words to the entrepreneurs, the young ones who are coming to Dubai want to start here. Um, they're grappling with the uh, the paperwork, the regulation, the bank account setup, trying to get the customers, the clients locally, internationally. What's your advice to them to survive and thrive in Dubai's environment? Fast-paced environment or slow-paced environment? What's your advice to them to survive and thrive? Yeah, like don't give up, right? Uh, things are not meant to be easy. They're going to be challenging. You need to be committed and, and persevere and move forward. This is a land of opportunities. I think there's no such thing as American dream anymore. It's the way dream. Uh, there's so many people that have come over here with very little and they have done remarkably well. You need to have a very disciplined, uh, dedicated uh, work ethic and you can, you can conquer a lot. You have a lot of... One thing I love about Dubai is... Um, uh, you have this, the, 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 the tone is set from the leadership, from the top down, right? So you have leadership, government over here that is encouraging people to innovate, uh, build businesses, etc. And you have access to them, right? Um, as me, as a young entrepreneur, etc., having access to key decision makers is impossible to find in any other market, right? Like I had the ability to, through one or two emails, get access to, you know, CEO of DIFC, for example, and go talk to them about the challenges you're facing and get them to action things to um, enable the ecosystem to thrive. Uh, nowhere in there else in the world I would have access to the leadership of a regulated entity, right? So Dubai gives you that opportunity. And if you are driven, uh, purpose-driven and you have something to add value, you will find a lot of support over here. There will be times, it's not going to be easy, you're going to hit a lot of roadblocks, but don't get discouraged. Just keep on and you'll, you'll, you'll do great over here. I like that. Thank you very much. You know, from the AD, American Dream, to the DD, Dubai Dream. I like that. <laughs> it was coined here by Sadiq Farid, right? DD, yeah. <laughs> it's the Dubai dream now guys listen if you haven't then you know obviously hit the like subscribe and bell icon uh stay tuned for part two part two is where we dive further into uh not just the entrepreneurial journey but also more about his life and how he's thriving thank you very much i want to thank him uh for this one and i look forward to talking to you again me too pleasure okay pleasure. thanks